Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special 90-minute edition of the Hopkinton Hangout Hour. Today, we talk with more candidates in this year's Hopkinton Town Election. Town Election Day is on Monday, June 29th. You can vote in person at the Hopkinton Middle School Gymnasium. In our first half hour, I talked with Parks and Recreation Commission uncontested candidates, Lisa Jackson and Laura Hansen. Hello, everybody. We are here with Laura Hansen and Lisa Jackson, candidates for the Parks and Recreation Commission. Lisa and Laura, how are you today? Good. Doing good. Thank you for having us on the call. Yeah, thanks for having us on HCAM. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, so uh, first off, can you talk about what made you want to run for the Parks and Recreation Commission? We'll start off with Lisa. I've had a long time interest in um, really outdoors and trails and community access to places to exercise for their kids to play, for people to take their animals um, out for walks or for my case, riding horses. So I've had a long time interest in parks and recreation. And when I moved to Hopkinton over 20 years ago, that was a big piece of why I moved to Hopkinton is because of the open space and the trails and all the access that we have as a community to um, use some beautiful spaces. Um, um, some that are well manicured, some that are more natural. Um, and, and really, I've also noticed over the years the great programming that the Parks and Recreation in Hopkinton offers to the community with all the classes and the training and the services that they provide. It's pretty impressive. Um, for a, a department that doesn't take in funding. It's funded by um, their programs. So to me, that's pretty impressive. From what I understand, other parks and recreation departments in cities and towns have um, a line item in their budget um, other than just for where they're housed. So that was another piece of me getting onto this committee as I wanted to advocate for the work that they're doing and really get the community to understand um, how hard they work to get the funding, but also to maybe look at some other ways that we can help fund um, the parks and recreation in Hopkinton. How about you, Laura? Uh, well, this will be my third term with Parks and Rec, and I really enjoy working with this commission because uh, they're very proactive, they're very responsive to the community, um, that, you know, whenever there's a, a need for a program, they try to, um, accommodate that. Um, I came on just as, uh, Jay Gelfi was, uh, 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 made director and he and his staff have just done a phenomenal job with programming and all the opportunities, uh, for, uh, everybody in town and to advance the community. I, I took on kind of the, um, the concerts on the common and Sandy beach and some of the other things, but I agree with Lisa. Uh, one of the reasons we moved here 21 years ago was because of all the open space and the trails and how beautiful it is and the access to water. Um, you know, all the lakes. Um, it's just, it's a beautiful community. And it's a beautiful town. So, um, we like to keep it that way. And, uh, and I think Parks and Rec is, is a very fundamental part of our community. And uh, so I'm very, I'm very lucky to be helping out with it. All right. Uh, can you talk about your volunteer experience uh, or past volunteer experience in the Hopkinton community, uh, Lisa? You want to have me start? Sorry. Sure. Volunteer experience. Sorry, I'm going to turn up the volume because of course the uh, landscapers are getting a little loud. Um, so my volunteer experience is um, I was very involved with the Western Nurseries um, Land um, Youth Study Committee. I was a member, an appointed member of that committee. And I also ran a community group uh, with Lisa Leary that was called Hope Hopkinton organized to preserve and enhance. And we really want to push forward um, the town buying um, the Western Nurseries property um, under 61A because um, Western Nurseries got a tax 
abatement because of that that um, 61A um, designation. Um, but we did lose that at town meeting. Um, or, so that was one of my first involvement. And then I got involved. Um, I helped found the Hopkinton Trails um, Club and um, worked with them for many years. And now John Ritz um, heads that and does a lot of great work with them. I also um, initially got community preservation funds to build the first part of the center trail that goes from Hopkinton Lumber all the way over to Chamberlain Road. Um, that was my project that I was involved with. And it was many years ago because I had my daughter in a backpack every day out working with the contractor to clean up the trail and get it usable and remove all the trash and put in all the water bars and, and, and rebuild some of the bridges. Um, so that's some of my volunteer experience. And then other volunteer experiences um, really working with the Medical Reserve Corps in disaster response. Um, we just ran a COVID-19 vaccination or um, testing clinic where we did um, COVID-19 testing and antibody testing last Thursday. So that's my volunteer background. And then and on my own, I clean up trails and take care of the trails um, as I use them. And I use them several times a week. How about you, Laura? Oh, I've been a <laughs> consummate volunteer, mostly revolving around my kids. Um, I've been room mother more times than I uh, can remember. Um, I was a Cub Scout leader for both of my sons and a Girl Scout leader for my daughter. Um, and I was on the, the, the committee. Um, I've been working with uh, Scouting for Food um, as long as I've been in Hopkinton. Um, and I've, uh, uh, so I've been, uh, that that's a, a b very big push every year, um, and I love I love that uh, that is a great um, opportunity to see our town uh, really pull together to to help fill the food pantry. Um, I've worked with Project Just Because quite a bit, um, and uh, just gen generally uh, just trying to stay active in the town and and where wherever I'm needed, basically. Um, uh, yeah. I, I actually volunteered for Bay Path quite a few times too, and I agree with Lisa. Um, uh, I I walk my dogs uh, every day uh, on the trails, and um, cleaning up trash is definitely <laughs> part of part of that experience as well. So yeah, uh, it's been a good time. <laughs> so so, uh, what are some of the goals that you uh, both wish to achieve in this uh, next term with the? Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, we'll start off with Laura for this one. Uh, well, my biggest my biggest focus has been trying to get this dog park built. Um, that initially uh, we changed locations, so now it's going to be at Fruit Street, and that looks like that's that's going to happen soon. Um, I also uh, really want Parks and Rec to be in a place that's um, that's. We, we've been moved around a lot and so it, I would I would like to see the, the the center school if that's an option for Parks and Rec or I, I'd like to see us settled in a place so we don't have to worry about being moved around a lot and um, and uh, I want to continue to do the concerts on the common this year they're gonna be probably not gonna have any in July but I hopefully we'll have a few in in August um, I'm working on um, uh, the trees on on the commons, trying to replant and and uh, get some of the older trees down. We're losing some of the sugar maples, um, and working with the historical district just to make sure the plantings are all appropriate and everything like that. And we're working uh, very hard to get some cameras at Sandy Beach and at EMC Park so that we can monitor what's going on at night there. Um, Sandy Beach. Uh, uh, is getting a lot of use and um, not always appropriate use. <laughs> oh, oh boy. So, so I would like uh, I would like more more action down there, and I also would really like to see the phase three of Sandy Beach, which is the parking lot area. Um, I'd really like to see that be built as well, um, and continue to, to support the commission um, for as long as I get elected. <laughs> Lisa, how about you? Uh, what are some of the goals that you wish to achieve with the Parks and Recreation Commission? A lot of what Laura said is um, certainly the stabilization of where the um, Parks and Recreation Commission is housed. 
um, since it's a staple in the community and they train babysitters, they do CPR training, they do a bunch of training that really protect the public health of the community. Um, I would like to see some stabilization and I would like to see more funding. Um, I think they're gonna get hit hard this year because a lot of the curriculum that they would um, usually offer um, cannot be provided due to COVID-19. So that is something I would like to see potential, um, a line item in the town budget um, that goes specifically to the operation of the Parks and Rec Commission, um, not only just the housing of it, but really uh, a more supportive role financially. Um, particularly right now, we're gonna need a lot of support with that particularly because of COVID-19 and our society is changing a little and our social activity is changing. And I think we look, need to look locally at, at ways that we can provide services and, and um, really um, outdoor sports services, um, services for kids in the community that Parks and Rec traditionally um, covers. And from my role in public health, I've been involved in public health and disaster response for 17 years. I want to be, be a resource to the Parks and Health Commission to look at the guidance that's coming from the CDC and the Department of Public Health and help them figure out a way to best um, manage these types of resources that we have in our parks and our um, organized sports um, groups to make it safe, but also accessible. So that's something I wanna look, um, I think I can provide some support and resources to the commission on that, given my expertise. I Right now I kind of live and breathe COVID-19 seven days a week um, and I'm involved in the response in many facets across the state. But again, I wanna reiterate um, the support of the commission and really, get the community to realize what they actually provide and what an incredible resource they are to our community and, and hopefully get people to use their programs. I would love to look at innovative ways to get training out to the public during COVID. Um, I've talked to the, uh, with Jay, Colleen, and Jennifer about that, about offering classes via Zoom um, in ways that we can do right now, um, even kind of an online babysitting um, program or having seniors or school students get involved through Zoom meetings to do projects or cooking classes or things like that with kids um, through Zoom or through a, a platform where it's, it's remote. So that's something I would love to see brought to Parks and Rec that kind of can fulfill that gap that they offer. And I, I have a good amount of technical experience so I can hopefully, um, and I write class curriculum and have developed a lot of curriculum that I can help them um, provide that service to the community. I'm very curious about the online babysitting. How would that work? Well, it came from, it's interesting, it came from a family member. And um, um, they have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And their Nana Banana calls in from Florida. The parents are still in the home, but she'll read stories to the kids or they'll play cribbage or fit, go fish on Zoom. So there's a few ways that I was, I was talking to Jay uh, I was talking to them about like, maybe we could get seniors that they're not involved in their normal stuff, like working at camps or whatever, that they may be able to sponsor a, a, a Zoom group with a bunch of kids to keep them active where the kids are home more. They would still be home with their parents, but they would kind of distract, pleasantly distract the kids. Right. Um, through video conferencing and and really give those parents kind of an hour, much like the teachers have been doing, um, have um, students and other community leaders come in and either volunteer or um, provide hours that they can sign off as as a senior that would go towards their college, because I write off stuff for that for the Medical Reserve Corps all the time, but do it in, in a community way, um, build, you know, a fairy garden or, or something. There's a lot of ways, and these, these, these high school and college students would be able to give back and, and provide um, an outlet 
and and share some of their fun expertise with the kids and kind of give the some enrichment to those children in the home but also giving a little bit of a break that's not tv or video games it's still um really virtual and it, it's through a computer or through a phone but it, it's it's an innovative way to have interaction with students that they can socially distance so i think it's kind of a fun idea and we can flesh it out and and see what we can bring up and we're open for ideas i mean we're about it we were thinking about sending out a survey to community members. Are you interested in doing this? Is there something you can offer? Do you want to be involved and kind of set up a volunteer group that can, can and help organize it? Because that's what I do. I organize volunteers. Um, so that's an area I can bring to the table and just set up something a little outside of the box, um, given the current situation we're in. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting and cool idea. Uh, and it could get the kids off those uh, video games they probably shouldn't be playing anyway, right? Right, right. <laughs> uh, Laura, so you're on the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission now. Uh, can you talk a bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic is going to make things more difficult uh, for the Parks and Recreation Commission? I know there's uh, probably big concerns about income from uh, the program since a lot of those programs uh, unfortunately couldn't happen or were limited this year. Yeah, it's been extremely challenging. Um, thankfully, I'm, Jenny and Colleen and Jay are just great and they're very proactive and they've made um, a lot of great online programming for uh, kids. There's, I, I, there's, a, there's a bunch of them. Um, the only program we're running this year is the uh, camp program because that was such an essential um, need for the community. Um, and they've been, I mean, just the, the regulation, the state regulations on um, the sanitation, you know, keeping it clean and, and uh, sanitized and um, going through all those uh, procedures, um, they've really taken to heart and adapted the programs accordingly. Um, uh, so every every Monday, uh, they will put out an e uh, email to all all of the uh, camp the campers and their parents to let them know what drop off procedures are and and things like that. And um, <clears throat> they've adapted the camp so that there's smaller groups um, and uh, taken taken all of that very seriously. Um, but like you said, all of our other programs, our basketball league, our the soccer, um, all of the sports um, have been severely limited and, and most of them haven't been able to, um, uh, we haven't been able to run them this year. Um, we do have a lot of uh, like grown up teams. Uh, I believe there'll be some little league going on. Uh, they will have an opportunity to play and um, the cricket uh, will go on as well. Um, so Fruit Street will be getting used. Um, but like I said earlier, um, we had to cancel all the concerts on the common for, for July, um, just because we're still in phase two. Um, and hopefully by August, I'll be able to have concerts on there and get a little more normalcy because we have movies on the common too, and we weren't able to have those in July. So we're, we're just kind of playing it year, uh, week by day by day, week by week. Um, it's been kind of unusual because um, usually we meet uh, every two weeks uh, in person at, at the office, <clears throat> but we've been meeting because so many things are changing so quickly and um, we've, been, we've been meeting every week and um, our meetings have been um, extremely uh, full <laughs> of information. Um, uh, so that's been, that's been really unusual, but um, the staff is great. Um, we did open Sandy Beach. We were uh, we we wanted to make sure there were lifeguards there over the summer, and we were able to um, hire back some of our staff there. But again, we're trying to adapt to that too because there has been a lot of overcrowding down there. Um, so yeah, it's a challenge. This is a challenging, weird time, and we're we're losing a lot of funds. And I think. Um, that's the other reason we really don't want to rock the boat and move to another location at any point in time soon, because we're just trying to adapt to this new normal. 
um, and try to figure out where our funding's coming from. And, and uh, like Lisa said, like our Parks and Rec um, does uh, get funded mostly by the community. Um, we do have a, a enterprise fund that we, that we can use too, but we have to budget for the year. And um, that's very hard to do because there, there is unforeseen thing, costs and, that come up. Um, and uh, so, so I too would like to see a different way of funding Parks and Rec because it is so important and we don't want to be limited. Um, but it will be a challenging year because of the lack of uh, funding that we get from the community and because we haven't been able to run these courses. So yeah, it's been an interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly has for everything. Yeah. Uh, but you mentioned the, uh, the concerts on the common. I know there's a lot of people that want that program back uh, since they really enjoy those and those seem to just get a tremendous turnout. Just about yeah, one of them. that's the problem. <laughs> I, I could see that coming back maybe uh, in August since it's outside and yeah. Yeah. I, well, we had, I think uh, it's doable too. I mean, like understanding um, the regulations and how things are changing. I think we could definitely, we have enough space there and we might have to amp up the speakers a little, but I think people could socially distance and wear masks and. Well, they were saying, they were saying that there, we might have to like have people reserve spots and that would just be not doable. So I'm hoping, I, I think, the, the groups that were going to play in July were a lot larger. And um, so th those were kind of out of the question. Um, but the groups that are playing in August are some of our, you know, local talent like Steve Spector and, and, um, and he's, you know, he's willing to come and, and as, as long as we figure out the logistics, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we'll have those back too, because they are very popular. They certainly are. And I know the musicians are certainly, uh, certainly want to play. I'm sure they're getting anxious uh, by now. Yes. Uh, so um, can you tell the uh, community a bit about yourselves? Uh, what are some of your interests and things you like to do in your spare time? Uh, we'll start off with Lisa. Um, I'm interested in a lot of things. Um, again, it's open space. I have six horses, so I ride quite frequently. Um, and that's my major use of the trails. I do hike on the trails. I like pretty much any sport. I like paddleboarding. I swim across Ashland State Park and Hopkinton State Park. Um, I like to skateboard. I like to ride bikes. <laughs> um, like pretty much any sport. Um, not I haven't done a lot of team sports, but I, I, I think they're wonderful. Um, but I, I do love almost any sport um, that's outside and, and on the trails or even on pavement for skating. And I like to um, rip stick. <laughs> I'll grow up. I'm 50. So, wow. You're brave. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but I like all those sports. So like for that, that's one of my, that's my hobbies, I guess, as I really love sports. Um, I love the social aspect of Hopkinton and the community piece of it. And that's another reason why I wanted to be on, um, the Parks and Rec's commission is I just see Parks and Rec as a way to bring community together and and for all to it's like a big family you know like when I moved to Hopkinton and got involved in volunteering I feel like um, I wanted to hug Hopkinton I guess or or provide expertise just like I just feel like it's my when you have a child you kind of become motherly to the child and other things so I kind of feel motherly to Hopkinton or you know I, I really care about our community I care about the people that live here um, and I hope I can I can bring um, some of that caring and, and some of my professional expertise um, to help with that I have I've um, been involved in the Medical Reserve Corps and I currently work with 221 um, municipalities in the state um, to do emergency dispensing site, which is like um, giving out vaccine or medication during a, a pandemic or an infectious disease outbreak or a bioterrorism event. Um, I also am involved in sheltering. So if there was a power outage or an evacuation um, or anything like that that would cause problems, I am a shelter management expert. Um, and I manage the volunteers and build curriculum for that. I also have a pretty decent technical background, so I can hopefully offer some of these ideas that I have um, to 
look at innovative ways to reach out to the community and share the the vast knowledge that we have in our community, but also kind of look at innovative ways for Parks and Rec to be able to get um, information out to the community, share classes, and provide some of that community that we've lost by coming together with sports and concerts and activities, but um, provide it in an online platform um, during COVID-19. So those are my interests. I obviously like friends, family. Um, I've been involved with HCAM for years and years and years, so I love HCAM. I did, I, I haven't produced anything in a while, but um, you know, I like the technical back end of, of um, developing. We did training programs for the Medical Reserve Corps many years ago. So I know some of the back end stuff and I've done a lot of filming and things like that, of community meetings and things like that. So um, I yeah. love it. Them too. <laughs> so, you've, cer you've certainly done a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, that's that's part of me. But that, and I have a 16 year old daughter, so I, I love any kids programs. I love the school district. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm really involved with my daughter and all the stuff she does. The concert band and um, she does science fair and and, and so I, we are uh, running a little low on time. I oh give, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, oh, that's give, it. I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> Laura, okay. what are what are uh, some of your interests and things you like to do in your spare time? Oh, I'm definitely an outside person as well. Um, mm -hmm. I have three dogs, and um, so I take them for a three mile walk in the woods every every day, and um, I love it. I love hiking and kayaking and I do a lot of gardening. I have a very big garden. Um, uh, it's strange for me because my kids are, are grown. I have a 24 year old son, a 21 year old daughter and a 16 year old son. And my 16 year old is very involved in the sports um, in town. He's a football player and a wrestler. So he's having a really hard time because they probably won't have football. Um, so that's been a new aspect to my life is the whole sports because my other two weren't athletic at all and this this so the the whole sports realm of hockington is a is an entirely different animal than say uh band um right. but uh and drama which was the other right. two right. so um but uh it's very strange for me not to be volunteering at the schools as often you know because you don't get that opportunity in high school so i do miss that a lot because that was a big part of my life but um i stay very active in my kids lives and um and i uh, try to be supportive uh, even though i'm not as good at team sports as my son is i don't really know know the rules of football but i'm i'm learning <laughs> well i am crossing my fingers that football will be back that is for sure so is he so that's, is a, he. Tough, that's a tough one in covid it's very i know uh, i have wrestling a lot. wrestling <laughs> is even worse yeah oh yeah well, one oh, good yeah. We, we cover ashland legion baseball so uh well, Legion baseball isn't coming back. There's a bunch of teams that are going to play in an independent league this summer. So we're okay. excited that we'll have some baseball on HCAM in the near future. Awesome. All right. So we only have a couple of minutes left. So I just want to give you each a minute or so to uh, just get out any final words and anything you want to tell the community. Uh, Laura, you could go first. Uh, I do want to uh, thank you, Tom. Um, HCAM has done an amazing job of, uh, filming the concerts on the common. We, we really appreciate John Ritz's work and, and uh, having you guys there. Cause I know a lot of people go back and watch it. It's, it's pretty cool. And so do the bands. Um, I, uh, I am really focused right now uh, on this whole potential move. I'm very concerned about that. And I, I really think the community needs to know um, that this is a potentiality because the property that we're supposed to move into was approved by town meeting to be a parking lot. And now they are uh, revamping this house to move us in on a temporary basis, which means that we'll have to move again. So our future is kind of uncertain as to where we're going to be. And like Lisa said, we, we, we hold a lot of classes there. We need space, we need um, consistency. And we need to be in the center of town where people can find us and um, know where we are and use us as a resource. So um, I really, I, I really wanted to uh, make sure that the community knew that this was happening um, and to uh, let their voices be known if they would like us to 
stay in one place because <laughs> we would certainly like to stay in one place and and um and uh be very accessible to the community and continue to run the great programs that we do and uh, uh you know i love i love that parks and rec has the whole spectrum between trails and out you know outside fun and team sports and music and it's just it's just a wealth of um it's a wealth of resources for the community so i'm very excited to continue working with parks and rec and um thank you very much for this opportunity tom yeah thanks for coming on uh lisa how about you any final words for the community i'll be real quick um it really reiterates what um, laura said i would like to see more funding for parks and rec outside of what they produce i would love to see stability in where they're located um, and also to jump off of that, um, the stability of that location, there's a lot of parking at that location. And as we know, downtown, if we start opening up for classes and they're on Walcott Street, parking is also going to be an issue for students that come to the classes. So I feel like that move seems a little um, difficult and maybe not the best decision and needs to be revisited before it's done. Um, and, and, and also just certainly, um, Note, letting the public know that the tremendous resource that Parks and Rec um, brings to the community and really look at ways of funding it that are outside of their own fund me um, funding mechanism by through fees and things that they use. I would also like to um, look at new online ways to engage the public and kind of fulfill the gap that we've lost during COVID-19. So I would like to, I'm open to ideas from anybody that are more technical than I am or that have ideas about classes, um, bring it to the commission um, and all of us as a group will look at it and hopefully be able to implement some new exciting ways to reach out to the public um, during this time. Well, Lisa, Laura, thanks so Thank much you. for uh, coming on today and uh, certainly keep us up to date with any uh, programs that are going to end up happening and we're crossing our fingers that there'll be uh, some good stuff this summer and hopefully the uh, things keep going in the right direction as far as the virus is concerned. Uh, but thanks again for coming on and uh, best of luck with everything. Thank Great. You. Thank you for having us and thank you. In our second segment, I talked with uncontested candidate for the Board of Library Trustees, Jessica McCaffrey. Jessica, how are you today? I'm good, thank you, how are you? Doing well. Good. And the weather's finally getting great, and yeah. uh, time to hit the swimming pools and the beaches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't had a chance to go to a beach yet, but it, the heat's definitely been uh, you know, inviting the, the the idea of going to a beach, maybe at least the, the town park here, at least just to get a little taste of summer. Absolutely. I think it's safe to say summer's finally here. Yeah. Agreed. So uh, what made you want to run for the library board of trustees? Yeah. So, you know, I've always been very appreciative of the existence of libraries and the resources that they provide to our communities. And, you know, I'm, I'm running for the Library Board of Trustees position as I see this as an opportunity for me to you know, serve my community by bringing my um, experience and professional skills as an attorney where I can help further the library's core missions. I can help in terms of advising and evaluating policies and just generally supporting the programs that the library offers. and. I've just always felt that contributing to your community is very important and for me to be able to contribute my time in this manner in a positive way is a very exciting opportunity. Terrific. Uh, have you had any uh, prior volunteer experience at all? Not specific with um, the Library Board of Trustees, but my sort of volunteer experience is dated back to you know, food banks, uh, volunteering at the Pine Street Inn in Boston, you know, helping with meal prep, meal serving. Um, I also had particular experience with Rays of Sunshine. It was a tutoring and mentoring um, volunteer experience with children of inner city Philadelphia schools. And um, another great uh, volunteer experience I had was with the CARES Clinic at the Villanova Law School where they represented um, clients who needed uh, refugee asylum or just immigration you know, assistance in general. And, 
I helped with everything there from answering phone calls to case intake to translating for Spanish speaking clients to going to detention centers you know, and, and helping in terms of prepare for depositions, procedures, et, et cetera. So they've all been great opportunities where I've been exposed you know, to a diverse set of communities, individuals, where it's been a lot of teamwork or even individual you know, management of, of work and just um, generally good life experience to, to accrue. Wow, that sounds terrific. Uh, it sounds like you got to meet some uh, very interesting people. Yeah, definitely. So uh, do you have any goals or particular tasks that you'd like to achieve with the uh, Library Board of Trustees? You know, I'd like to compliment the library's um, Board of Trustees, you know, their, what they've done for the library so far in the community. What I'd like to bring is some diverse background and experience and maybe fresh perspectives in terms of ways to continue advocating for the library and the community that it serves. I think they've done great work so far. And um, the Hopkinson Public Library, obviously, they had the uh, renovation a couple of years ago. Um, wh what are your thoughts on the uh, new renovations at the library? Um, I think it's beautiful. You know, Stan actually was kind enough to give me a tour, kind of, um, you know, on a whim, and he gave me a bit of um, background information in terms of, you know, the, the way that the structure was kind of kept in terms of the, the former church. It's beautiful the way that some of the ceiling structures are still there. Um, and it was interesting, you know, to hear how long it really took to get it to be ADA compliant, but overall the way it looks now is, is gorgeous. I think it caters to a lot of the different types of patrons that the library has, and I'm very proud to have that in town. Yeah, and they have a whole lot of programs. They had a whole lot of programs at the old library, but especially now they certainly have the capacity to yeah. host everything they want to do. Exactly. Uh, so, so, uh, Part of the reason for these interviews is to, uh, or the main reason is really just to allow uh, the community to get to know the candidates a little bit more. Uh, yeah. So can you uh, tell us about yourself? What are your, uh, some of your interests and things you like to do in your spare time? Sure. Well, so I'm 33 years old. I live here in town with my husband on Lumber Street. Um, we live with our dog, Spencer. We rescued him through Bay Path Humane here in town. Um, I'd say anything that I can do with Spencer is my favorite activity. <laughs> uh, what kind of dog is it? We have no idea. We um, talk about doing DNA testing all of the time. We just don't get around to it. But I'd say he's probably a combination of, um, you know, a chow. He probably has a little bit of golden retriever in him. Um, he's, he's just a very unique dog and he has a great personality and anybody that meets him would, would say he's very fun to be around. But other than that, so, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm an attorney. I work at a firm in, um, the financial district in Boston. I manage a team of attorneys there. And when I'm not working, I love reading. Um, I like doing puzzles. The more pieces, the better, you know, the more challenging it feels. Um, I love doing anything outdoors, you know, even just hanging out outside, being able to enjoy the nice weather and the tranquility is fun. Um, my family lives nearby too, so I, I really just enjoy just spending time with them as well. So I saw in your uh, candidate statement, you are a big reader. Uh, what are some of your favorite books to read? Anything, you know, suspense, mystery, thriller, those are my favorite go-to genres. If I'm looking for, you know, a quick book to download on my Kindle, James Patterson is my go-to author. Um, I've probably read the majority of his books, but I also like good, you know, beach reads as well. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's uh, very relaxing to just uh, lay on the towel on the beach, <laughs> pop open a good book. Yeah. Uh, uh, so what do you think some of the biggest obstacles will be facing the Library Board of Trustees with the pandemic situation? Yeah, I'd say, you know, the, the health and safety of the patrons is obviously paramount to, you know, a, a safe reopening of the library. Being such a, you know, community center, it's a cornerstone of the, of the community. So I would imagine that trying to implement, you know, some of the so social distancing measures within the physical space of the library will likely be a little bit of a challenge. I'm sure a lot of people are eager to get back to the library. I personally am, but I, I would imagine that, you know, trying to sort out um, the sort of physical aspect of maintaining social distancing while still being able to kind of cater you know, to the programs that are typically offered um, might be a little bit of a challenge in terms of 
let's say spacing, you know, the chairs that are there, computers, you know, how many can be used at a given time? How many people can be in the library at a given time? Do you limit you know, the time that people are in there? Because I can spend a lot of time at a given time. Um, and even, you know, considering can things like story times still proceed as, as we normally would expect in that safe manner? Um, even things considering as far as, you know, cleanliness, how do you maintain, you know, cleaning the areas that are most trafficked and disinfecting surfaces and whatnot. So I think I've seen, um, you know, notes in terms of the library, even considering things like curbside pickup or drop off and um, just sort of adhering to some of the changes that might become um, a bit normal in these new, cha in these new times. Well, I know they've done a lot of e-programs such as having the story time uh, through applications like Facebook Live and Zoom and stuff like that. I, I think they've uh, done a pretty good job at uh, preserving some of the programs throughout this uh, virus pandemic. I totally agree. I, I have loved to see the social media presence that the library has had. It doesn't seem that they've skipped a beat at all. Um, I think that they've done a great job of keeping, you know, community engagement, um, you know, free programs that are available, even recommending programs through other libraries or neighboring towns. I think even offering, uh, you know, book recommendations. And I even read a, a post where somebody said that they, were walked through, you know, how to use a Kindle, how to electronically download a book. And I think it's wonderful that the library is very much kept up with, you know, electronic changes and is, is helping its community and, and trying to, um, you know, use those resources too. Yeah, and the ebook programs, they were even becoming huge before the uh, pandemic, but especially now, very yeah. valuable resource. Uh, in your candidate statement, you mentioned even recently, our library allowed me to make new friends through a book club, which has been genuinely fun and positive. Uh, can you talk about the uh, book club and your experience? Absolutely. So we started book club just before quarantine started. So we had to transition over to Zoom meetings, um, but it was a really nice outlet, you know, as we were getting sort of accustomed to being at home and <laughs> trying to stay occupied. And it was, um, it was great for, you know, a couple of different reasons. One, it was really great getting to meet new people here in town, people that I might not have necessarily crossed paths with on any given day. And so it's, it's nice to make new friends that way that share similar interests. Um, it also expands, you know, your sort of um, experience in terms of what types of books would you read. I wouldn't always necessarily choose a self-help book, but it's very interesting, you know, to be able to read new genres, new authors, um, just new concepts. Um, it allowed us to have really enriching discussions in terms of our interpretations of the chapters and the experiences in the books and even talking about if we've personally, you know, had that sim similar experience. I think it's, it's very fun to participate in a, um, in a book club, you know, it's thought provoking, it's enriching, it helps socialization, you know, finding new friends. And it's definitely something that I would recommend to anybody who likes reading and, and would be interested in a you know, discussion of uh, context. And was it all uh, like different genres of books that you would read in the uh, book club? We're considering the next book. I'm not sure what sort of genre we'll go towards this coming time, but um, the last book that we read was more of a self-help reflection, you know, talking about experiences at different stages of life and managing work, a family, like life expectations and whatnot. So very um, applicable to all of us that were reading the book at different stages of life. That's terrific. It sounds like a very uh, nice social experience and uh, it sounds like you get to meet a lot of uh, interesting and, and uh, people with similar interests if you like reading. Yeah, I would, I would love, you know, for our book club to expand or I would encourage you know, other individuals to consider starting their own book clubs if they're you know, looking to sort of um, follow a particular author or genre. But overall, I've, I've really appreciated being part of it. Very cool. So it was the library that started the uh, book club or was it uh, just a just That's a good question. Um, we met at the library. I, I don't know that it was specifically the library, but the library was at least a conduit in allowing us to use space there, you know, to, to meet uh, together. And um, the library had, you know, the, the copies of the books that we needed as well. Ah, very nice. Uh, so do you have a uh, favorite feature or a program at the Hopkinton Library? You know, I think the library is great in that it, it really caters to all ages of its patrons. Um, I think it, it's 
it really bears in mind the different sort of life stages that people are in or the experiences that people may be going through and um you know from things like the um bed to student you know the the baby to toddler story times to how to's on how to stage your home you know if you're looking to sell it to mental health awareness and whatnot i think it's wonderful that it very much caters to a community as a whole um, and even more recently, I think one of my favorite um, programs that it had was the the mini golf event. It was amazing to see how the you know the inside of a library became a mini golf course, and it was awesome to see how many kids and their families were there, and just the excitement overall. It was um, a really different and unique experience. You are not the first person to say the mini golf program. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people enjoy that experience. And that's such a cool program to implement there. And yeah, they do a great job getting uh, all the ages involved with these programs. Definitely. Uh, uh, so how's your uh, quarantine experience been uh, during these last few months? And uh, what are some of the things that you did during the uh, midst of this recent virus pandemic? I've been very fortunate um, to have been able to work remotely. I actually have not been back to my office since about mid-March. So I've been keeping very busy, you know, still working full time. My husband does as well and we manage, you know, our different workloads very well. Um, when we're not working, you know, I've, I've really invested a lot of time in reading, um, a lot of kind of alternating, you know, between, um, suspense or mystery thrillers and also just reading books that help in terms of management style, um, working, you know, with different backgrounds and whatnot to just kind of um, further, you know, any other education that I can get from that. Um, we've tried, you know, to kind of explore the neighborhood, some of the walking trails, especially having Spencer with us. We've tried to, um, you know, help the local businesses too by getting takeout and whatnot, but otherwise it's, it's been a very quiet quarantine period for us. We've, we've spent a lot of time catching up on series, starting new series. It's, I think it's, um, it's, it's been a nice time for us. You know, I know it hasn't been pleasant for everybody, but it's, it's been a very quiet um, you know, downtime for us. That's wonderful. And um, one of my thoughts was the, what, what's uh, the happiest about the quarantine period is probably the pets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say um, my company's very pro dog. Spencer came to the office with me every day. It just turned out that the week that we were told to start working from home was the first, you know, couple days that I started leaving Spencer at home and training him <laughs> to stay at home. Um, and he definitely loves having us here. I think he may have a difficult time when we transition, you know, back to working full time, but he's definitely benefited from our presence uh, at all times. Yeah. Now that he's uh, used to having you around, you might have to retrain him with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think we might need to revisit some of our, you know, earlier training. So uh, you went to uh, Villanova university. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about that experience? And I have to know, did you take in any of the basketball games? <laughs> you had a tremendous program over there. Yes, so it was a, it was a great school, um, gorgeous campus, really nice area, you know, close enough, but far enough from home to kind of learn to live independently as well. But um, it was wonderful in that there was a really diverse backgrounds at the school and a lot of opportunities to take as a student. It obviously didn't hurt that you know the the basketball team was nationally ranked, and um, if I didn't you know get a basketball ticket through their lottery there was no question that we were buying one as long as tickets were available. And um, it was just a great experience. You know, even when they played at the Wachovia Center, which I think is now called the Wells Fargo Center in Philadelphia, it was, it was like a half day or full day event, just a really great experience. I'm still a proud Wildcat. I love watching them when they're on TV and especially love rooting for them during March Madness too. Uh, one of the things I missed most about this year was March Madness. Yeah, <laughs> I can't, know. Me too. <laughs> can't beat that tournament. Uh, but that's terrific. Villanova, certainly, uh, all their games just seem packed. Seems like there's a great intensity for their basketball team. <laughs> there should be. Yeah. It's a tremendous program. Yeah. Uh, so now we got some rapid fire questions for you about <laughs> some of your favorite things. And it's, it's totally K. Okay it's totally okay to say you don't have a favorite or say, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, so favorite food to eat. Um, pizza. Can't yeah. go wrong with that. 
uh, favorite food to cook? Oh, I, anything really ground turkey. I love making a Thai style ground turkey. Very nice. Uh, favorite <laughs> vacation destination? Oh, locally, Lake Winnipesaukee. We love going to Meredith, Center Harbor area, but if I had the choice, I would go to Greece again. <laughs> and you you're not the first person to say that either. I, heard <laughs> I had the fortune to study abroad there one summer during college, and it was an amazing experience. Um, it's been over 10 years, and I hope to make it back someday. Oh, wow. That, that's tremendous. Uh, what, what are some of the things that you did while you were in Greece? So we really um, traveled throughout Greece. Uh, a lot of our sort of classes were focused on the different historical sites that we were visiting. So it even included, you know, studying like Greek mythology and then play, you know, playing out some of the actual plays. Um, aside from that, we, you know, really got to um, spend time with the local, you know, individuals. They're just trying to absorb the culture there. Um, very relaxed environment. I loved how a lot of the dining was outdoors. It wasn't rushed. It was very family style. Um, it just really felt like, uh, you know, an atmosphere where they very much enjoyed, you know, spending time together, eating a meal together. Um, it was a, it was a wonderful experience. Now, I lived in Watertown for a while, and they had some tremendous Greek restaurants there. So I have to ask, how was the food in Greece? It was really good, although I am not a fan of tomatoes or olives. I, I did have to be a bit annoying <laughs> in asking you know, for um, removing a couple things. But I remember being in a particular area called Plaka, where there was a tiny restaurant that um, you, know, you could order gyros from, and they stuffed it with french fries and it was just it was two euros and it was amazing food to to order i remember we would go there quite often maybe twice a day it was really good food that's tremendous all right so um back to the rapid fire questions favorite musician oh um you know i really like dave matthews band i also um i like coldplay a lot and um I don't know. I, I really have a wide range of music. You know, even when I'm working, I listen to a lot of movie soundtracks. I just, I like recognizing the music and being able to concentrate. But yeah, I would say Dave Matthews Band and Coldplay are amongst my favorite too. Very nice. Uh, two very talented groups there. Uh, favorite song? Favorite song? Yeah. Oh, I don't think I've ever considered this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know that I really have one. <laughs> See, in my case, it would be too many to name. <laughs> yeah, it depends on my mood, I guess. If I want to get excited, if I want to feel mellow, or if I just want to you know, know the words and sing along. Exactly. Uh, and, and for me, you know, sometimes I'm in the 80s mood, sometimes I'm in the, uh, the dance mood. You know, it all depends <laughs> what you're in the mood for. Uh, favorite, yeah. favorite form of entertainment, whether it's sports, theater, music, I, I would probably say music. I really enjoy going to concerts. I think it's a whole experience, you know, and being around other people that really have an appreciation for that artist or, um, you know, that band. It's, it's fun, you know, to, to make a night of it or a day of it. I, I love outdoor concerts especially, but, um, you know, I feel like music is, is applicable to any, you know, experience that you're going through, and it's just a, it's a nice form of entertainment. And um, you kind of answered this one before, uh, but do you have a favorite book? Um, hmm. You know, I very, science fiction is not my genre. However, I really enjoyed reading Interstellar. I have just always been um, very, you know, mystified by the idea of space. Even during quarantine, my husband actually bought me a telescope so I can look at the stars out here. But um, just the concept, you know, was so amazing. I have loved watching the movie afterwards to see how, you know, the, the author envisioned it. But um, in terms of, you know, content and, and quality, I'd say Interstellar was my favorite book. Very nice. Uh, favorite restaurant? Locally, is Could that what you're asking? could be locally it could be <laughs> worldwide whatever you want. 
locally at Dick Cornell's, there's never been a meal that I've ordered there that I did not love. Um, but if I, you know, had my choice of chains, I'd probably say Chipotle. I, I love everything there. I've had, uh, I enjoy both of those places. Uh, <laughs> when I worked in Watertown, my work was right across the street from a Chipotle. So okay. <laughs> took advantage of that. And uh, certainly Cornell's is just tremendous. Great, yeah. great food there and uh, always a good time. Yeah. Uh, favorite movie? Well, Interstellar is one of them. I just love the visuals of that. Um, you know, I really, this is, it's a little bit corny, but I love a dog's purpose as well. Um, you know, I, I love my dog very much. And I love the concept of that movie of showing how, um, you know, the, the vital roles that dogs play in our families and the ways that they can come back into our lives in different ways. It's a sad movie, but I love the concept of it. Excellent. Um, favorite actor or actress? Hmm. Um, actor, I really like Matthew McConaughey, and I, I especially liked him when he was in The Lincoln Lawyer. Um, I think he's just, he has a very diverse, you know, background in terms of the characters that he plays. Wonderful. Okay, so you're out of the rapid fire now. <laughs> <laughs> I survived. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, so have you had a chance to talk to um, any of the current library board of trustees or any of the staff there uh, about anything? Yes. So I actually attended one of the last um, in library uh, uh, board meetings that they had. I, I, you know, I wanted to meet the individuals that were currently um, on the board and those that might have considered, um, you know, running for re-election. I got to meet Heather, the director, and a couple just other individuals working there. Everybody was very welcoming, um, very excited, you know, at the prospect of, of new potential candidates. And um, it was just very reassuring, you know, that this is a position that I was very interested in and I look forward to, uh, you know, to getting to participate with the with the board of trustees. Absolutely, it, it, they do a the board of trustees does a great job as well as the staff. So I think you'll uh, certainly have some fun on the board of trustees. Um, so we're just about out of time. So I just want to ask: Are there any final thoughts or anything you want to say to the voters in the community? Yeah, you know, I, I thank you for considering me. I, I know that there's a lot of candidates that have experience and you know, just dedication to serving their community. I um, you know, would love the opportunity to serve the community and I just appreciate their vote. All right, Jessica. Well, we uh, wish you the very best of luck. Thank you. Uh, with, I mean, you're uncontested, so more than likely you'll get in. So we <laughs> wish you the very best of luck with yeah. the Library Board of Trustees. And uh, we look forward to seeing what the future brings and hopefully we'll have the library and all their programs open back up soon. But thanks yeah. so much for uh, coming on today. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate you having me. In our final segment today, I caught up with school committee candidate Joe Markey, who is campaigning for one of the two seats available. Here is our interview with Joe. Hello, everybody. We are here with school committee candidate Joe Markey. Joe, how are you today? Good, Tom. Thank you. How are you? Doing well. Nice Can't to hang out with you today. Absolutely. Glad you could join us. Uh, so you're running for the uh, school committee. Uh, could you talk about your uh, prior volunteer experience in the Hopkinton community? Sure. Yeah, I, I follow the uh, school committee pretty closely. So um, uh, I was happy to be able to step up this year, have a little time to, to offer to town. Uh, as you know, I uh, most recently chaired the elementary school building committee for building Marathon School. And that was a great project. Uh, we started in 2013. And uh, the school opened uh, last year, uh, 2018 school year. So it's been two full school years through there. Um, and uh, it was a great project. It involved a lot of community engagement up front. And that was kind of my hallmark is getting public input and consensus building up front and then uh, executing based on the feedback we got from the community. And that, that approach seemed to work well. Um, <clears throat> prior to that, I was on the planning board for five years. Uh, 2006 to 2011, during which time uh, the uh, Meza family put their property up for sale and there was a long process there and uh, a lot of town planning involved in figuring out what to do. We came up with the idea of kind of a master plan overlay 
and uh, began executing on that during my tenure on the planning board. And so uh, what made you end up uh, deciding to run for the school committee? Well, uh, from the vantage point of the elementary school building committee uh, with the Marathon School, uh, we had a lot of interaction with the school committee and uh, found that to be very constructive collaboration with the school committee. And um, it turns out that the, the knowledge and expertise that, that we collectively have learned through the building a marathon school is probably going to come in handy again for some of the other uh, facility planning initiatives with our other schools. So I kind of view the facility challenge as, as one of the big uh, things facing the district over the next uh, five to 10 years. So I'd like to be able to offer some of the expertise that uh, we learned uh, and, and, and help the town through this next phase of growth. And uh, three very qualified candidates in this year's race. Uh, how has your com campaigning experience been during this time of social distancing? I'd imagine there wasn't too much door knocking. Yeah, um, you know, interestingly though, I have found that a lot of people are going out walking a lot more than they used to, maybe because they used to get up and get in the car and go commute to their job and now they're working from home. So there's a lot more people out walking and I tend to sit out on the front yard and as people pass, say hello. Uh, uh, and then, uh, so there, there's been some interaction. I, I also run and see people that way and give a friendly wave. <laughs> but you're right, it's different for sure. Um, not a lot of handshaking, none. <laughs> and not a lot of meeting people at these different events that we used to go to. Um, so definitely different. Absolutely. Um, so uh, one of the reasons we do these interviews is to give the uh, community a chance to get to know the candidates a little bit better. So uh, tell the community about yourself. What are some of your inter interests and in, uh, things you like to do in your spare time? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm a runner. I have found uh, a little more time recently to indulge in that interest. Uh, starting mid-March, started just kind of picking up the miles a lot more. Um, I have run the Boston Marathon um, four times, four years in a row. And um, I'd like to do another marathon at some point. My last marathon was 2016, I think it was, Marine Corps Marathon. Um, so I enjoy that and the level of running I'm doing now uh, wouldn't be too much of a stretch to do uh, to kind of move into marathon training. Of course the problem is finding <laughs> finding a half marathon or marathon to run because they're all closed down right now but at some point uh, they will happen again and you know I'd like to stay in good enough shape to have a good base to uh, to get in and, and do that. I also have a family as you know um, and so we've had a lot of time together uh, lately, quarantined, I guess, or whatever you call this, a shutdown. Um, my wife had been substitute teaching, so that kind of dried up, right? And uh, my, uh, my employer, Dell, uh, shifted us all to work from home. Um, so that's going really well. The only thing is, uh, you know, and the kids were doing their school for the last couple of months. Uh, but the fact that we're all home at the same time doing all those things, that, that can be challenging sometimes, and that's been an adjustment. But all in all, I would say it's been a positive experience to have the additional time at home, and we've learned each other's schedules and which rooms people like to use, and it's all, uh, all working out. So good family bonding going on. <laughs> right. <laughs> I would say, yeah, good family bonding, but also it's important to give one another space, too. And I would uh, credit my wife and family for recognizing that too. So they, I talked about running, uh, but they uh, at times encouraged me to go for a run, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody needs a little space for one another and Bernadette enjoys hiking and, and exploring trails. So we each give each other space and then it seems to all work out that way. Uh, that's terrific. Uh, when was the last uh, Boston Marathon you ran? It was 2015. Wow. I always forget to ask uh, someone that runs marathons this, how tired are you after running 26.2 miles? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, you think um, you run, so 
if you're well conditioned, you feel pretty good after it. If you haven't trained well, then it feels pretty awful. <laughs> so I find that going slow because you haven't trained as well as other years, uh, it's not easier by going slow when you haven't trained properly. So training uh, is key. And then uh, that makes the actual marathon day just kind of a check-in on how well your training was executed. Yeah, and most uh, marathoners we talk to, they're training all year long. I'm, su I'm sure you're uh, putting a good amount of training in there. Uh, so I think it's uh, tough to tell how the school year is going to look in September. There's been talks uh, cutting classroom size, the amount of students allowed in a classroom or having students even alternate between physical school and e-learning. Uh, what's your take on how the school is going to look uh, next September based on what you've seen or heard? Yeah, um, we're getting close, right? <laughs> Approaching the end of June and a couple months to go till we execute. Um, I know the superintendent is working really closely with the state and there's all kinds of working groups set up to um, plan this. Uh, what's unnerving is that the state guidelines are not complete yet. And um, I've heard all the same things you have, but I think they're all kind of speculation and they're potentials right now. So um, I have deep confidence in the superintendent and staff that they're going to find the right solution. And I know the school committee has been, and the community has been giving good feedback on the experience we had with the remote learning, the pluses and minuses. And I know they'll take that learning into, uh, and put that into practice too. So, um, you know, the, the school committee, in fact, is a policy making committee. And we're fortunate to have a wonderful uh, professional staff that we oversee. Uh, one of the key uh, responsibilities of the school committee is to hire and provide performance reviews of the superintendent. Um, and we provide some community direction and input as well and some leadership in that regard. Um, but it's, in my experience, I've seen it go both ways. In my experience and my perspective is that when the volunteers start getting involved in the nitty gritty of classroom execution and things like that over the expertise of educators is when you start to see problems. And I was here prior to the town charter and we saw the same thing on the board of selectmen at that time. You saw selectmen getting involved in the very nitty gritty detail of professional staff roles. And that's why we ended up voting in this charter commission to uh, change and define clearly the roles of selectmen versus professional staff. So I intend to respect that too on the school committee. Um, and again, empower, enable, challenge and question uh, our professional staff, but recognize that we're a policy making and uh, a performance review oriented board. And uh, have your kids or anyone in your family uh, mentioned anything about how the e-learning is going? Yeah, different opinions for different learning styles, I guess. Um, yeah, without, you know, violating my children's privacy, I, I, I guess we run the gamut, you know, it could be student to student or class to class, but uh, there's definitely pluses and minuses. And I, I think those with kids are, are familiar with what those are. Everything from the, uh, when you're live in the classroom, it's a little more easy to stay engaged. When you're on a Zoom call, uh, you may or may not be more focused or less focused. Uh, when you have to execute a series of steps to download, print, submit, uh, you may get lost in the detail depending on your learning style or you may not. <laughs> for some, I think it's greatly efficient and for others, it's a, it's a challenge. And uh, what do you think some of the biggest obstacles are going to be facing the school committee with this pandemic situation? Well, budget is a big one, right? We've heard from the selectmen uh, to expect a, a downturn in revenues. Um, I know that the, the brightest minds in town are working to uh, alleviate and balance all those issues out and uh, things will probably be better for us than other communities but uh, I think the budget uncertainty uh, just as financial uncertainty is difficult for investors it's difficult for us to the, the uncertainty of what to expect uh, and how much will these 
amenities cost to implement and what will be covered and not by federal programs and state programs and what will we be left with um, that uncertainty. And again, as mentioned, we don't even have definitive guidance from the state uh, education folks yet to know what uh, accommodations to make, but we're moving forward assuming certain things. Well, that uncertainty is the biggest challenge, yeah. Right, and you would hope things like sports and uh, plays and uh, band concerts are back because I'm sure uh, revenue from those events help. And also, of course, the kids love those activities. Yeah, those are part of the big part of the development of our of our young students. Yeah. Uh, so you were involved with the uh, marathon school construction and downtown improvements, as you mentioned in your candidate statement. Uh, could you talk about uh, those projects a little bit and what your role was? Sure. Um, uh, yeah. For I mean, if if you don't mind, I'll go back to planning board too. I mean, we. There uh, did a lot of the, the advanced planning uh, and, and zoning uh, planning for what became Legacy Farms, and then developed a master plan uh, to, and approved the master plan special permit. Uh, from that experience, I learned the importance of community engagement, and that's why I wanted to talk about that <laughs> first. And then, you know, after planning board, I, my intention was to take a little time off. I had seen people get burned out before, and I didn't want to be one of those people who starts taking things personally and feels under attack, you know, because you do get stressed out a little bit on these, on these uh, controversial issues. So I felt like I got through the planning board, uh, master planning of Legacy Farms pretty well and with my integrity intact, and I uh, felt it was a good time to take a little bit of time off. Uh, however, a couple years later, um, I guess after sufficient rest, you know, I had a son born in 2011 and spent some time more with the family and less of these committee meetings. But then within a couple of years, it became clear we needed uh, to help with the um, marathon school planning. At that time, it was called the center school planning. And um, I, I, folks reached out to me from the selectmen and school committee, and I agreed to help. And I was happy to, and we immediately realized uh, we got some great folks on the committee, and I credit the Selectmen and School Committee for the formation of that committee that I was privileged to chair. Uh, what I think I brought was the ability to, um, when things get contentious, to uh, recognize the noise from the true subject and pick up the ball and move the interest of the town forward and not get caught up in, um, what are sometimes political spats or whatever you might call it, but kind of remember the, the purpose of your committee. And I, the first few years, I probably drove the committee crazy, but I would start each meeting by reading the charter of the committee because there's lots of opinions and a lot of related issues, but I wanted to keep conversation focused on what we had been chartered to do. And it made for more efficient meetings too, I think. And um, that was my role there as chairing that committee, keeping it focused. And as you know, uh, during the planning, we ran up against a few roadblocks that uh, we had to get through. One was the state continuously, drastically underestimated our enrollment needs. And we continuously brought back to their attention, again, with help from our state senator, Karen Spilka, and Rep. Carolyn Dykema, brought back to their attention our true uh, anticipation of population growth. And we came to a reasonable, um, solutions both through the design and through the final agreed numbers and the state did up their numbers but then during construction as the concrete was being poured literally that week uh new enrollment numbers came showing that uh we needed more uh classrooms in the school with uh quick help and response from the selectmen and school committee and and the msba the state agency we were able mid construction to uh, modify the footprint of that building, get town meeting approval for funding, additional funding in case it were needed, and build four additional classrooms. Now, as you know, the population keeps growing. Uh, and the good thing is we have room for additional classroom addition to that building in the future as well. But that was our role there is getting through those challenges. As for downtown, I, I live a um, quarter mile up Ash Street from the Common. And so I pay attention to those issues as a citizen. 
And I saw, I feared we were headed towards a disaster after 10 years of planning. As you know, back in 2010, I was on the downtown revitalization committee and my key contribution there was getting that committee uh, out of continual discussion and get us to document a vision, an architecturally drawn vision of what the downtown could look like. And that formed the basis for a lot of the other work that came out of other committees in subsequent years and ultimately led to this downtown project. So I had some history with that project and I saw some challenges that the selectmen were facing with communications in the community and uh, didn't feel comfortable leaving it to play out on its own. And so I stuck my neck out a little and uh, formed a, a small group of like-minded citizens and we put together some fact-based talking points and tried to uh, help move that project forward. All right. Um, so uh, how has your uh, quarantine experience been during these uh, last few months? And uh, what are some of the things that you did uh, during the midst of this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, it's been very strange. I remember thinking back to the first few days, how strange it felt to have sudden shutdown of no more traffic driving by and no more cars on the road the first couple of weeks. Now we're starting to get back a little to that now, but it was quite a drastic change in wearing masks. And initially it was still some places that had their drive-throughs open and we were like, driving pretty far to get a Starbucks now and again, just to see what was going on out there. And it was like a, a wasteland, right? It was everything shut down. Uh, and the, anyway, uh, but as on the home front, uh, as I mentioned before, some adjustments, you know, understanding each other's schedules and space needs and things like that in terms of who's using which room at which time. Um, challenges everyone's facing. Uh, I, I've always found running helps me get through periods of transition and, and challenge it gives me space to think about things and digest things. And I think that uh, it provides a little resiliency when I'm in good physical shape. I have more resilient to, to the, the challenges of the daily challenges that pop up. Um, so I knew that would be important for me to, to, to invest time uh, in running. Uh, and again, up, up to a couple hours and some days more up to three hours on some days uh, running. <laughs> and that, that seemed to help. Um, I found that uh, my kids though, they had schedules with their online classes um, the demands were less and there were less things to do in the after school hours, right? Because usually they had after school clubs, after school sports, um, and they didn't have any of that anymore. Uh, scouts, all, all the evening events were canceled. Um, so at some point I came up with the idea to do a reading project. And I, I don't know if you know, I was a liberal arts major in college and we just run, read a ton of books. It was all the great books, you know, the classics of Western civilization. And, you know, I studied Latin as well. So I really enjoyed all that stuff. But the volume of reading was such that um, I wouldn't surprise my professors by saying it here publicly. I didn't finish every book, you know, in college. And so I've got a lot of these great classics that are uh, somewhat read, almost read. <laughs> so I picked up the Odyssey and I explained it to the boys. And my daughter, I invited everybody to listen in. It turned out the boys were interested and the others opted out. <laughs> they said, have fun. So we actually read Homer's Odyssey. It's a great epic poem about uh, the, the challenges of uh, Odysseus as he leaves the Trojan War and tries to find his way back home. And uh, I thought it was kind of a fitting uh, epic novel or epic poem to read through as we navigate these uncharted waters ourselves these days. So I personally really enjoyed reading it. We just finished it uh, over the weekend. So it took oh. a while, it's a long book, and I had to leave time for questions and discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we've done. I've did a lot of running, some reading, and you can see in the back there, um, we planted a vegetable garden too. Oh, very nice. Excellent, yeah, I mean, I think yard work was a big thing during this uh, pandemic for many people. Certainly worked on a few projects myself. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a cool program you implemented there to keep the kids entertained, right? Yeah, I wasn't sure how it would go, but it turns out the boys especially, um, they look forward to that routine. They're at the age where those routines are still important. And with the loss of the structure of the school day, that uh, evening read, uh, half hour, 20 minutes or half hour, became an important part of their 
uh, routine. So uh, we got through it and they enjoyed it. And now they want to read the Iliad, but I might go on to some other genre. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, we got some rapid fire questions and it's All right. about, about uh, what are some of your favorite things? It's totally okay to not have a favorite or say, I don't know. Uh, so favorite food to eat. Oh, uh, I am so lucky that Bernadette cooks awesome stuff, but I really like the, the pesto pasta. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, favorite food to cook? Uh, I'm not allowed so much in the kitchen. That's kind of, <laughs> we talked about space. That's her space. <laughs> but I can cook. I like cooking eggs, I guess, and pasta. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm more of a grill guy myself. <laughs> we do have a grill, yes. <laughs> favorite vacation destination? Uh, we, we enjoy uh, Vermont, Lake Champlain. Uh, I guess you gave me one choice, so I'll leave it at that. All right. Uh, favorite musician? Uh, you know, I was having a conversation with a friend recently. I like a lot of different music, and it's hard for me to make a list of my favorite. I tend not to think that way, but... Um, I've always been a big Beatles fan and I still am. And so I, it is still my go-to. I still got uh, records and CDs collected over the years. Uh, so that's that. Yeah. For me, it's uh, whatever I'm in the mood for, but too many to name. Uh, right. And this next one might have too many to name. Uh, favorite song. <laughs> yeah. Again, I can't do it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> too many. Favorite form of entertainment. Music, reading, theater, movies? Yeah, I'm fairly illiterate with movies. Uh, I do enjoy a good movie now and again. Um, uh, reading is something I do enjoy. TV, I, I don't know, my brain's on a different time frame than TV news and things like that, so it's tough. But I, 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 guess, I guess reading, that's kind of sad. Music and reading, entertainment, yeah, I don't know. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, sports, that's entertainment too. That's true. Uh, favorite book? Well, I just read The Odyssey, so maybe I'll just say that's my favorite book. <laughs> favorite restaurant? Oh, boy. Uh, and, and some people choose to go restaurants out of Hopkinton for this one too. <laughs> yeah. You know, I guess if you base it on the frequency of visits, which is probably a good objective way to do it, it appears that our favorite restaurant is Wendy's in Milford. <laughs> there you go. Um, the, uh, Frosty's. Pretty good burgers there. Uh, <laughs> fa favorite movie? Uh, just saw a great movie uh, with Bernadette at home. It was uh, called Knives Out. It was a really cool mystery, a little quirky, um, set in Western Massachusetts where I grew up. So it was kind of cool. I, I enjoyed that. Very nice. Uh, so we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, so before we wrap up, I just want to give you a chance. Uh, if you have any final thoughts or anything you want to say to the voters in the community. Sure. Uh, make sure you vote. Um, I would like if you voted for me for a school committee, but just at least vote. Um, the town's trying to make it easy for everyone. Uh, you can still show up at town hall and get a ballot, I believe, and, and bring it in by election day to the town clerk. I guess it has to be in his hands. So you could bring it to election day if you already have one at home. Or if you are comfortable voting in person, I'm sure they're gonna have a proper social distancing controls in place at the polls. Uh, probably have to bring a mask. Um, please vote. I guess I'll close on you know my philosophy or what I've learned from others too while volunteering is, um, the folks who seem to do the best job at moving the town's interest forward um, tend to be the ones who, in the midst of a fray, can kind of sniff out that, hey, this is outside our agenda, this is outside our scope. I've always been the one who recognizes that and respected others who do, and then can move the town's interest forward and separate out the noise from the mission and move the mission forward. Um, I think we should be, aware, be wary of volunteers who put themselves too much at the center. 
I've always given credit where it's deserved to all the other great expertise on the school building committee into the town and town engineer on the downtown project and, and others. Uh, but when you start taking it personally and feel under attack, those I've seen multiple times, those are warning signs that it's time for that person to take some time off and relax and get regrounded. So always look for candidates who are fresh and who have the resiliency and who have the stamina to always put the town interests first, not their own uh, problem of the day. We wanna elevate the conversations, not bring people down. So that's my advice, I guess, and my wisdom. All right, Joe, uh, well, we are out of time, but thanks so much for joining us. We wish you the best of luck. Okay, thank you, Tom, and have a great day. A big thank you to all the candidates who came on the show to talk with us. And we remind you, Town Election Day is Monday, June 29th. For everyone here at HCAM, I'm Tom Nappy. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. Talk to you again soon. I'm Haley. Hi, hi, Davis. Jake. We're the Hiller Volleyball Team. My name is Emma. My name is May. My name is Shelby. My name is Sophie. We're Al and Gal, and we love H Camp. We love H Camp. And I volunteer for H Camp TV. And I watch H Camp TV. And I love H Camp TV. And I love H Camp TV. We love H Camp TV. Good morning, I'm Eric Cardi with the Hopkinton Water Sewer Department, and today we'd like to go over some water tips to help you in your home check for leaks and show you some important uh, features in the water system and how you can help uh, protect in the, in the event that you do have an emergency. Uh, so the board we have here is just kind of a demonstration of the water system and how the water gets into your home. Uh, from the water main, we have a line that comes into your property, and right at the property line, we have a shutoff called the curb stop right here, and that's something that we're able to access in the event that uh, your valve inside the home does not work, so we can shut that off in any emergency. So one of the most important things for every homeowner that has uh, municipal water to know is where that main shutoff valve is in your home. Generally, that line is coming in facing uh, off the street, so it would be in your cellar, uh, most likely, and it's on the side where the water line faces the street coming in. This valve right here is before your water meter, and what you want to do with that is just make sure that that turns. It's a quarter turn valve, in order to shut, and that'll shut the whole supply off in your house. So if you ever had a uh, pipe that broke inside or if you had uh, a problem with a plumbing issue and you, in an, any emergency, that's where you'd go to first shut off your water and that'll isolate your whole house for you. Uh, right next to that is the water meter and the water meter can be one of the, uh, the best tools for you as a, a homeowner, a resident, uh, or businesses in order to make sure that, uh, that you have no internal leaks in the house. So the water meters read almost like a car odometer. The numbers go across. And what we recommend is every now and then, when you know that you're not running anything in the house, the dishwashers are off, washing machines are all off, is just to take a, a meter reading on that water meter, wait an hour or two, then come back and take another reading. If you see that that reading has changed, then you know that something is leaking. And nine times out of 10, it's a toilet. Well, most of our high water calls are for leaking toilets. And they can use upwards of 200 gallons a night. Uh, most people, think that they would hear the toilet running, but what happens is the tank will actually drain down into the bowl, and it's not until that tank is empty that it actually kicks on and refills again. So you may not be uh, near that and able to hear it when that actually ends up being emptied out. So we recommend that you, you do this check in order to help uh, make sure that you don't have anything leaking in the house. Also, our other number one call starting this time of year is for high bills is for water sprinkler use. And again, water meter is a great tool for seeing how much water you're actually putting out on the lawn. Uh, the recommendation is for about an inch of water uh, a week for your lawn, and this will give you a good indication of how much water is going out. So again, read, take a meter reading on that. After your sprinkler system runs, you can come back, check the readings uh, that are in cubic feet, and there's a simple calculation. One cubic foot is uh, 7.48 gallons, and that'll give you an idea of how much water is actually going out on the lawn. Uh, so those are two of our biggest calls for, for um, high water use, and 
this water meter here will give you a good indication of what's going on in and outside of the house. Uh, one of the other things that we uh, recommend also is uh, uh, during this time of year is uh, to keep up with our news feed. We have a lot of things going on this time of year. We have uh, several hydrant flushing going on. A lot of businesses are required to do fire flow testing. And when that happens, that can stir up the system. So we try to give everybody as much notice as possible. And we put that out on our Twitter feed at uh, Hopkinton uh, Water. And we also do it, uh, if you want to get it via email, uh, there's a uh, link that we'll provide at the end of this that will give you an opportunity to sign up for our news feed. And again, we, we don't uh, inundate uh, your email with uh, notices. We only put out the important notices that uh, if there's a water break and there's going to be discoloration or some other important news so that you can re receive that directly uh, via email. Uh, so that's it for now, and thank you for watching.